If you are not yet here, please raise your hand. Oh, you want to say more? Yes. Why? Because I'm going to introduce you to them. Oh, they know. Let's just go. You don't want to? No, no introduction. Okay. 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 <laughs> so please, please just give him a round of applause. Okay, thank you. As you see on the handout, I have four topics today. And the first one I love talking about. This is research that is not my own. This is what I have learned from other scholars, and it has helped me enormously as a writer. And I hope it will help you too, and help your students. It's going to make life a lot easier. It's about writing. Yesterday, we talked, or two days ago, I talked about reading. Today, writing. Number one, writing is output not input. We acquire language by input, not by output. The research confirms if you write more, it will not make you a better writer. Would people think, oh, our students have low scores on writing tests, so let's increase writing in school. No, that doesn't help. Increasing writing does not increase language acquisition, does not increase literacy, and the studies confirm this. But writing does something else. Some of you are writing right now. The chances are good that no one is going to read what you're now writing. Probably not even you. But it helps, doesn't it? Writing takes ideas that are vague, that are abstract. You put them down on the page, they become concrete. Writing helps thinking. Writing helps problem solving. Writing makes you smarter. There is research evidence for this. Let me give you the best evidence I know. This is evidence from an American newspaper. In uh, North America, there are many years, she died a few years ago, but there was an advice columnist. Her name was Ann Landers. And people would write her with their problems. You know, my mother-in-law doesn't understand me. What should I do? My husband spends too much money. And Ann Landers would write back with the answers. I'd like to tell you about a letter written to Ann Landers in 1982. It goes like this. Dear Ann, should I marry the guy or not? Let me tell you what the problems are. He's 31. He behaves as if he were 14. He can't hold on to money. He's borrowed money from me three times, and he keeps getting fired from his jobs. My parents don't like him, and he's jealous. When he brings me home at night after a date, he calls me up again 20 minutes later. He says he wants to say a final good night. I know he's checking up. He thinks I'm going out with someone else. One night, I was in the shower. I didn't hear the telephone. I got up the next morning at 6.30. He was asleep on the front porch. Now the good things. He's very good looking. I find him physically attractive. That's about all. I've been sitting here for 10 minutes, and I can't think of another good thing to say about him. Don't bother answering this letter. You've helped me more than you can imagine. That's what writing does. You sit down, you write it down, and the answers become clear. You, those of you who keep diaries, many of us keep diaries. When I have a personal problem, I write it down. Just writing it down, 10% of the problem goes away immediately. Isn't that true? Sometimes the whole thing as we saw in the letter to Ann Landers. The profession in the United States called language arts, language arts research, has had one great success. And this is the discovery of what's called the composing process. You've heard about this, sometimes called the writing process. The writing process is very good stuff. It's helped me a lot. The writing process are strategies that good writers use to solve problems, make themselves smarter, and avoid writer's block. 
You know about writer's block? Everybody has writer's block. I have writer's block all day long. My life is one big writer's block all the time, okay? I'm very familiar with it, but there are ways of working with it. The classical composing process, if you look at the handout, I have the elements written, has four major components. I want to describe the components and then add a few more. The first one, the big one, revision. Good writers know that as you go from draft to draft, you come up with better ideas. Average writers think all their ideas are there in their first draft, and revision is making a neater version of the first draft. They don't understand what Peter Elbow said so well. In writing, meaning is not what you start out with. Meaning is what you end up with. Isn't that beautiful? The first draft is never sufficient. I am now going to quote Ernest Hemingway. And remember, what I'm about to say are the words of Ernest Hemingway. They are not my words. As a scholar, I must quote him exactly. Ernest Hemingway says, the first draft of anything is shit. <laughs> Isn't that true? This is a breakthrough concept. Other writers have said the same thing. I like getting quotes from writers. They've helped me a lot. Here's Neil Simon, a wonderful uh, writer of plays. Mediocre writers write, good writers rewrite. Neil Simon says 90% of his work is rewriting. Same thing with me. Kurt Vonnegut, I love quoting Kurt Vonnegut. He says, novelists have, on the average, about the same IQ as the cosmetic consultant in the big department stores. Our power is patience. We have discovered that writing allows even a stupid person to seem halfway intelligent. If only that person will write the same thought over and over again, improving it just a little bit each time. It's a lot like inflating a blimp with a bicycle pump. Anybody can do it. All it takes is time. This is profound and correct. So revision is the first thing. We are taught not to revise from school. School doesn't give you time. You have to hand in your paper. Time, timed writing is the enemy of good writing. The problem is you have 40 minutes to write a paper, hand it in, right? Or one day. If you get a new idea, you should be happy. But no, I've got to get my paper done. So new ideas are the enemy of school writing. After reading all the research on revision and reading Kurt Vonnegut and Neil Simon, I am so psychologically healthy that when I have to revise, I'm happy because it means I'm learning something new. Revision is good. The second uh, aspect of the composing process is planning. You've learned about this in school. You're supposed to have a plan. Good writers always have a map before they start on their trip. That's true, that's good. Here's an important change, though. The plan has to be flexible. You have to be willing and eager to change it. Here's what's going on. You start writing, and you have a plan, an outline, you follow the outline, and then in the middle of writing, writing makes you smarter. You have a new idea. You have to change your outline. That's good. It's not bad, it's good. Every time you are forced to change your outline, you have learned something new. You have a new idea, a new insight. Some, and Peter Elbow says, when you're two-thirds done with your paper, go back, outline it again. You'll be amazed how much you've learned. This happened to me recently on a long flight. I was, travel, I was on an airplane, it's like 12 hours from Los Angeles to Hong Kong. And I had to sit next to this guy. Oh my God, the passenger from hell. Big, ugly guy. He had all these tattoos. And he looked like he was going to a meeting of chainsaw massacres. Okay? Because he was one of them. He looked like he had just killed three men on the way to the airport. 
he fell asleep on my shoulder. I tried to be really macho, you know. So, you know but after a while, that was enough. So I got up, took my computer. On long international flights, there's a place where they have snacks. So I went there, I put my computer on the shelf, and my paper was all done, the paper I was going to deliver at a congress in Hong Kong. But I decided to re-outline it. I had nothing else to do. I outlined the whole paper again. I found so many new things. For most people, they would be upset. I thought I was done, I'm not. No, after reading all this stuff, I was happy. I made a new outline, I revised the paper. I learned something new. Go back and change it. Uh, the third part of the composing process, Hemingway has helped us here again, is rereading. The enemy of writing, a reason for writer's blocks, is that you don't remember where you are. Isn't that true? When you're working on a project, you're working on a paper for school, you let one day go by, you forget where you are, right? So you, you, you are reluctant to start again. The way around this and the way to get new ideas is to reread what you did yesterday. Uh, Hemingway, Hemingway is not like me, he gets up early in the morning. I rise at first light and I start by rereading and everything, everything and rereading everything, everything I've written to the point I left off. Jonathan Kellerman, I reread to to get a nice introduction to segue into new material that brings the old ideas back. Finally, everybody is, agrees with this one, delay editing. Poor writers edit as they write. They make sure the spelling is right, the grammar is right, the punctuation is right. This is wrong for two reasons. It's a big mistake. First of all, if you're worried about form and you're worried about editing, you won't think about your ideas. You'll be distracted. Number two, the draft you're working on now is not your final draft. Why bother? Don't put on your makeup before you take your shower. I would never do that, okay? It's a waste of time. Well, these are, oh, then, of course, the elbow says, while you're writing, pretend that you hired an editor and that when your writing is done, the editor is going to come and clean up all the spelling and punctuation, and then you hire yourself to do it. Well, these are the four classic principles of the composing process. I want to add two more. Number one, do you remember when you were in fourth grade and you were in school and you had an assignment you had to do in class. It was quiet time in class while you were solving a problem or writing a paper. And you were staring at the ceiling. Remember that? And what did the teacher say? The teacher said, is the answer on the ceiling? Remember that? <laughs> Happens to all of us, universal. Well, the answer is yes, it is on the ceiling. There has been very interesting research in creativity about the value of taking very, very short breaks where you are temporarily mindless. Then the answers come. I found this in a book published in 1926, written by a man named Graham Wallace. Here's what he says. Problem solving often requires an interval free from conscious thought to allow the free working of the subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind will give you the answers. He got this from a famous physicist named Helmholtz who said that whenever he had a lot of trouble in his physics research, he would go for a walk. And then in all directions, happy ideas come unexpectedly without effort, like an inspiration. They never come when my mind is fatigued. True or not true? Absolutely. Or when I was working at my working table. They came, 
during the slow ascent of wooden hills on a sunny day. Let's go back to the first quote, Frank Smith. Composition writing is not enhanced by grim determination. The next case is my favorite, and this has influenced me enormously. A French mathematician named Poincaré. Poincaré lived about a hundred years ago, and his mathematics was very important to Albert Einstein. It helped a lot in developing the theory of relativity. And every time, I've, every book I have that has articles about creativity, a famous essay by Poincaré is always included. Now, this is about a hundred years ago. Poincaré says, when I'm working and I'm doing my mathematics and I get a block, and he says the blocks happen all the time. It's always problems I can't solve. I stop, I get up, I put some wood on the fire, I come back 10 seconds later, 20 seconds later, and the problem looks a little bit clearer every time. This has influenced me. I have to tell you about my personal life a little bit and what happens to me in hotel rooms. I have very strange behavior in hotel rooms. This has happened to me constantly in the Hotel Casablanca. None of you have been in my hotel room. It's so interesting. When I get to a hotel, the new room, I don't know what happens, but immediately a mysterious force takes over, a poltergeist. And within 10 minutes, the room is a disaster. My stuff is all over the room. I don't know how it happens. My toothpaste is on top of the television set. My underwear is in the bathtub. I don't know how it got there. So I don't try to clean up. I think there's nothing more boring than cleaning up and unpacking. I can't stand it. But you have to clean up a little because the lady comes in to clean the room and you don't want it to look bad, okay? You prepare for the, isn't that you too, right? Okay, yeah. This is so messy, I'm embarrassed, okay? So I don't clean up, I start to work. Like I'll have three papers to read and a letter to write, a letter to newspaper and some footnotes. I start to work and I write and I encounter a writing block immediately, immediately. After three minutes, I have my first writing block. Or I'm reading something and my mind starts wandering. You too? All of us. I get up. I go to and I take the toothpaste from on top of the television set and I put it in the bathroom. I go to the bathtub, I put my underwear where it goes. Then I go back to work. Two minutes later, another writer's block. I go to my suitcase. I take out one shirt, only one, I hang it up. My goal is not to unpack. My goal is to do incubation to help my work. After two hours, the work is done. I have read two papers, written comments, I've written a letter to the editor of the newspaper, etc. And the room is clean. At home, I wash the dishes. When I wash the dishes, everybody has to leave the kitchen. I can take a 20-minute job of dishwashing and I can get it done in two hours. Because I'm not thinking about the dishes, I'm thinking about my work. Work for a while, have a block, wash two dishes, put away one dish. When I get near the end, it's put away two, wash one, okay? And I don't try to finish. If you try to finish, it's horrible. You get very bored. I do the work. This absolutely works. Short periods of incubation, which school does not allow. The final part of the composing process, I would like to suggest to you, I've called daily regular writing. And those of you who are looking at the handout, we're on page two. I discovered this from a professor at the State University of New York named Robert Boyce. Robert Boyce is a professor of counseling. And his job is to give advice to professors. 
junior professors. Now, at universities, being a university professor is pretty scary if you're a junior professor because there's something called tenure. After five or six years, you are evaluated. You have to show them your publications, your portfolio, etc. And if you've done good work and your teaching is okay, you are promoted to associate professor and you have tenure. It's hard to fire you. It's a guaranteed employment. If you don't get it, your career is ruined. It's very scary. So Boyce looked at these junior professors and he found they divided themselves into two groups. One group he called daily regular writers. These were young professors who were disciplined. They put aside a certain amount of time each day to do their academic work. Some of them 30 minutes, some 40 minutes, some two hours. It didn't matter. These young professors all published papers. They all got tenure. They were all promoted, no exceptions. The other group were called binge writers, B-I-N-G-E. Everybody knows this word because we know about that with diet. You're on a careful diet for a week, and then you binge on ice cream, for, and then it's all over. You have to start all over again, okay? Binge writers are those who say, I don't write every day. I have to write when I'm inspired, and the conditions have to be perfect. I need five hours at least of uninterrupted time, and it has to be absolutely quiet, traffic has to change their patterns. Airplanes cannot fly over my house. It must be perfect. Well, Robert Boyce looked at these people. None of them got tenure. None of them got their work done. First of all, the five hours rarely came. Nobody has five hours just to work, no matter who you are. Second, when it did come, they didn't know what they were doing. They had forgotten what their ideas were. They had, they, were, they had lost their place. They spent the time staring at the computer screen or staring at a piece of paper. It's the daily regular writing. Now, why is it daily regular writing that works? Famous authors here have helped us enormously. I'll give you a few of them why it works. Uh, look at Rosellen Brown, the quote at the top of page two. Writing is a job, not a hobby. You have to sit down and work, schedule your time. Okay, it works for creative writing. Walker Perry, you gotta sit down and follow a schedule. Unless you do that, you won't ever do anything. These people don't know each other. Irving Wallace, he looked at famous authors. Most of them keep regular daily hours. Some of them in the morning, some in the evening. Some of them make sure it's a certain amount of time. Some writers count pages. Other writers count words. I'm a word counter. I have a quota, 600 words a day. That's me. It works for me, I don't know why. Less than 600, I feel incomplete. More than 600, I feel stale. The ideas stop. Now, why? Here are the interesting quotes. Stephen King brings us close. Don't wait for the muse. Don't wait for inspiration. Your job is to make sure the muse knows where you're going to be every day from 9 till noon or 7 till 3. Susan Suntag comes closer. Any productive writer learns you can't wait for inspiration. That's the recipe for writer's block. Madeline Langle, famous children's author, okay? Got it, 100%. Inspiration usually comes during work rather than before it. This is today's message. Inspiration is the result of writing. You don't wait for an idea, then write it down. That doesn't work. Start writing. Now, I have another life in California. Uh, my other life, I'll tell you about it. I become pretty famous in this other world. Living in California, it is a state law that you must be involved in show business. So I am in show business. I started my show business career at age 65. Since then, I have written eight musicals. 
and they have all been performed. Last time, there were more people in the audience than on the stage. I thought that was pretty good, okay? I write musicals every year for the synagogue where I go. I'm a member of the local Jewish synagogue, and every year in the spring, we do a play, and it's based on the Book of Esther. This is a Jewish holiday called Purim, so it's a Purim play, or in Yiddish we call it a Purim spiel. We take the Book of Esther and we write a musical based on the story. The story, all Jewish holidays have the same story, okay? They tried to kill us, they failed, now we can eat. It's always the same, okay? <laughs> so there's this evil king, or this stupid king, Ashaverosh, who sends his wife into exile because she won't take off her clothes and dance for his friends. Then this young Jewish girl, Esther, be becomes queen. She uh, wins a contest. And uh, there's this bad guy named Haman. He wants to kill all the Jews because he's angry at Esther's cousin. And he tries to kill the Jews, and the king stops because Esther says, look, I'm Jewish. You kill them, you kill me, you kill the queen. And that's the end of the story. So I'm supposed to get a new theme every year. Uh, we've done it, the best one that we did, I think, was based on the music from Mamma Mia. We changed the words. Of course we did Frozen this year. It was so much fun. And sometimes, sometimes I'm the orchestra. I'm, I play the piano while they sing. And this year, I, I acted. I had one of the parts. I played the bad guy. I played Haman. I found my inner Darth Vader. It was really fun. So here's what happens. Every year, I procrastinate. Do you know that word? Everybody in this room knows this word. I procrastinate. What are, we just did it last week. We had it last Sunday. It was great. And we, it was a, very, a lot of fun, the performance. Anyway, I start thinking, what am I going to do next year? And I can't think of anything. So I do nothing. And then around September, when the big Jewish holidays come, I sing in the choir in the synagogue. And the choir members are the cast members. So I kept reminded, I've got to come up with an idea. What are we going to do? And then I remember... Madeline Langell. I remember Stephen King. No kidding. I think of them. And I realize I have to sit down and start to write even though I have no ideas. You see? This is magic. I tell myself I'm only going to write for five minutes a day. And it's always scene one is the same. It's the king. It's Queen Vashti. He sends her into exile and all that and I make the characters, and I start to write. And I remember Ernest Hemingway. The first draft is shit. It doesn't have to be good. Ernest Hemingway's statement is liberating because I can revise. I start to write. I write five minutes the first day. The second day, I get interested. I write 10 minutes, then a little more. After two weeks, the first draft is done. Does that sound familiar? Then starts revision, the rest of the composing process. I revise it. I meet with the musical director of the synagogue, the cantor. He's the director of the program. Usually we meet at Denny's, and we go through the whole thing together, and we change it. One year we met at Denny's, and we were singing at this, was sitting at this one table for like 30 minutes, well, for about two hours, going through the songs and singing them back and forth. When we left, the people at the next table applauded. They said, oh, we really liked your singing. That was nice. Anyway, he changes things. He changes it because he has a background in show business, and I don't. So he can tell how it's going to look on the stage. He makes great improvements. It's always better. Then in rehearsal, the cast changes it. And then in performance, the cast changes it because they've lived the characters. They know the parts. I get credit for all the improvements because I'm the writer. Isn't that nice? Okay. So this is it. You have to do a little each day. You cannot wait for inspiration. It comes as the result of writing. And I gave you the idea, the example of me doing this work at the synagogue to show you that this is the universal way that we create ideas. Um, Daily regular writing also helps for another reason. 
if you don't write every day, and I mentioned this before, you forget where you are. Good writers, I suspect, have routines to warm up. In the morning, even after coffee, I don't want to do anything. I sit down with the computer and I start doing something mechanical. Some writers work on bibliography first, and that starts the machine going. Or I work on something very easy first, just to have a feeling and get back into the flow. Here are some quotes. Flaubert, I have the peculiarity of a camel. I find it difficult to stop once I get started and hard to start after I'm resting. Isn't that true? So good writers have routines, ways of getting themselves interested. Gore Vidal, I'm reluctant to start work and reluctant to stop. This is universal among creative people. If Charles Dickens missed a day of writing, he needed a week of hard slog, hard work, to get back into the flow. Daily writing and routines for getting interested. Well, that's the end of that topic. Let me now move to my second topic, completely unrelated, grammar. I didn't talk about grammar yesterday. Everybody says, Steve Krashen says, don't teach grammar. Teach grammar, go to jail. No. Here's my view on grammar. It is not forbidden, not at all. Grammar is a part of language instruction. It is peripheral. It is not the main character. What our work says is that grammar is very hard to learn and very hard to use. Grammar is limited. Not illegal, but limited. And it can help in certain situations. So we must understand what it's for, what it's not for, what it can do. Um, back in the 1970s, before your mother was born, I um, talked about the monitor hypothesis, which I still think is true, and I said that the main function of grammar is as an editor. After you've said something and you realize you made a mistake, you can go back and correct, you can inspect what you said mentally and make corrections from rules, and when you write, if you make a mistake, you can go back, edit, make the correction. And that's okay, but it's hard to use the monitor. It's very, very difficult. There are three conditions that must be met, and they are all necessary, and they are all difficult. They are daunting conditions. Condition number one, you have to know the rule. That's hard. Let me do an activity with you. It's in the book that some of you have in front of you, the 1982 book. Take your pen and please draw a circle on your notes about the size of a large coin. Okay? Let's say that circle represents all the rules of English. We know more about English than about any other language, so we'll use English as an example. So you have the circle. Let's say we go to the world's greatest syntactician. We go see Noam Chomsky himself, the world's greatest syntactician. Noam Chomsky knows more about English than anyone alive he knows more about English than anyone who has ever lived because he's always discovering new rules of English. And we asked Professor Chomsky, how many rules of English do you know, you and your colleagues? Well, Chomsky is very modest about these things. And he says, well, we've, we've only discovered fragments, but let's give him a lot of credit. Draw a circle inside your circle that represents all the rules the world's greatest linguists know. Give them a lot of credit. In mathematics, we call this a proper subset. Okay, let's go to another group, grammarians. Professional grammarians are people who write grammar books. They don't discover new rules. Chomsky does that. But they read Chomsky's work and they put his discoveries in the books. So they don't know as many rules as Chomsky, but they know a lot. How many rules do professional grammarians know? The textbook writers. Draw a circle representing what they know and give them a lot of credit. Next, grammar teachers. 
consider dedicated fanatic grammar teachers who know a lot of grammar. How many rules do they know? They don't know all the rules in the book, but give them a lot of credit. They love grammar, they think about it all the time, they read grammar books. A slightly smaller circle. Another circle, you soon run out of space. How many rules do the best grammar teachers teach? They don't teach all the rules they know. The next circle, how many rules do the best language students understand? Another circle, how many rules do the best grammar teachers understand and remember? The tiny little dot you have is the limit of the conscious monitor for our best students. For most people, it's a lot less. Knowing the rule makes it very hard to focus too much on grammar. It's a huge task. Well, that's only one condition. Condition number two, you not only have to know the rule, you have to be thinking about rules. You have to be focused on form. This is extremely unnatural. Most people do not focus on form. The grammar people think that the purpose of our existence on Earth is for us to think about grammatical form 24 hours, seven days a week and make sure we get all our errors corrected and we study the rules constantly. If we tell them, no, the purpose of language is for communication, they're not interested. They think the purpose of language is for grammatical analysis. And if you want to use it for speaking, listening, understanding, go ahead, that's your own business, okay? Number three, you gotta have time. It takes time to retrieve these grammatical rules, drag them out of your memory and apply them. Put yourself in this place, let's say, you're an inter low intermediate speaker of English as a second language. You're having a conversation and you want to use the tag question. John is a boy, isn't he? And you're having this conversation with a native speaker. Okay, I want to say John is a boy, isn't he? Let's look at the first sentence. If there's a subject, if it's a pronoun, you use the pronoun. If it's a noun, drop the noun, change it to a pronoun. Let's look at the verb. If it's a regular verb, drop it, put in a helping verb. If there's only a helping verb, you use that. If the regular sentence is positive, you make the tag negative. If the sentence is negative, make the tag positive. Then you change the word order. By the time you do that, your conversational partner is long gone. The only time these three conditions are met, know the rule, focus on form, and have time. There are really two places they're met. One condition is when we give people grammar tests. When you give someone a grammar test, they know the rule, they can focus on form, they have time. And I first uh, found this out in my studies in the 1970s and 80s, and I found more research on this, and I keep publishing papers. The studies that show that grammar works in every case, the conditions are met. They give people grammar tests. They have them study a rule, then they give them a test. And the results are always very small. Even when the conditions are met, people still can't use very much grammar. So the results of all this research on grammar show that it's very hard to use grammar. It's not very efficient. Another time you can use grammar is, and this I think is okay and it's a good idea, is when you're editing your writing. Uh, this is when you've already acquired most of the language and you're writing and it is public writing and it has to be correct. Uh, in fact, you really, when you write in public, your writing really must be 100% correct, you know that. This is an unfortunate characteristic of the human race. If a famous person makes a spelling mistake in public, Lifetime humiliation. The American Vice President Dan Quayle made a mistake spelling potato. And this, his grandchildren will hear about this from generation to generation. 
I'm not a fan of Dan Quayle, but that really was unfair. That could happen. So when you write, you've got to get it right. And even native speakers make mistakes where your personal dialect is not the same as the standard. This is why we teach rules in high school, and you have them in all languages. In my case, there are about 10 rules of English, punctuation rules, spelling rules, that I have not acquired. And if I want to get them right, I have to look up the rule. My favorite is its and its, with apostrophe, without apostrophe. The research I've done on this, uh, about two-thirds of well-read native speakers have acquired it. They get it right. About one-third have not, and I'm one of them. If I want to get it right, I have to look up the rule. And this is normal. This is what happens. So when you get to high school age, it's a good idea to show students how to use the grammar check, how to use the spelling check, and make sure things are correct. And to understand the grammar check and spelling check, it's a good idea to know a little bit about grammar. So I would include a little bit of grammar in high school. First language and second language, subject, verb, prepositional phrase, all that stuff. But it's a small part of the program. So that's the grammar stuff. The newer methods in foreign language education, I think, do a terrific job with grammar. Um, Natural approach, Tracy Terrell's method. I worked with him in the 80s. This was high school foreign language in the, I'm sorry, university level foreign language in the United States. No grammar in class, some grammar as homework. And it was not expected that the grammar you learn at home, you'll be able to apply when you speak. Today, TPRS, which I think is a wonderful method, your homework assignment, Look up TPRS, Google TPRS, it's terrific. I mentioned it the other day, we talked about stories. Uh, Blaine Ray, the inventor, has this idea called pop-up grammar. Now let's say you're teaching a class and you and the students have the same language. Like here, you're teaching English and you're, both, you're all Spanish speakers. The teacher stops the class for a moment and says in the first language, by the way, this is a grammar rule, this means that. It could be five seconds. I'll give you two examples. Uh, I like to go to TPRS classes, and I've taken intermediate Spanish with TPRS. In one class, the teacher, a guy named Jason Fritz, who I think is a wonderful teacher, we were doing, playing this game, creating a story. It was a lot of fun. And Jason stopped the class and said in English, by the way, this O at the end of the verb, that means past tense. That's all. And then he continued on. Those of us in the room who are grammar people thought it was fascinating. The other students, called normal people, just ignored it. I took beginning Mandarin from Linda Lee, my buddy. And she was doing, we were doing this wonderful activity in Mandarin. And she stopped the class and said briefly, by the way, in English, in Mandarin, we don't have infinitives. We just string the verbs together. Now, me and another student, Carol Gobb, we thought that was the most interesting thing anybody could say. But the rest of the students simply went on with their lives. Five seconds. That's all it takes. Excellent. And these methods work. They produce more grammatical accuracy than the grammar methods. Fascinating. Well, I want now to take about five minutes before I get to the final topic and bring in a hypothesis that in reality I came up with in the 1970s. But I haven't said it often enough, and I haven't said it loud enough. Another important pronouncement, similar to the ones I made the other day. Today I want to announce the end of the grammatical syllabus. The idea of the rule of the day. The idea that today all the activities are to help students learn the future tense. We're going to talk about making predictions about the future. What will you do tomorrow? I'm going to say it's not necessary and it's harmful. It prevents the acquisition of grammar. Going back to the 1970s, another hypothesis, the natural order hypothesis. Remember that? We said there's a natural order of acquisition. 
We go rule one, rule two, rule three, all the way up to rule 10,492, however there are. And I invented new terminology that managed to confuse everybody. That's a good thing to do for your career. Let me give you some career advice, junior scholars. If everything you say is clear, you get no respect. But if people don't quite understand what you're talking about, they conclude you must be a lot smarter than they are. <laughs> and it's really good for your career. I did that with this idea of I and I plus one. Nobody understood what I was talking about. So they, they assumed I must be very smart. Well, it's actually a simple idea. By the way, I doesn't mean anything. It's just arbitrary. It could be Z, it could be X, it could be a picture of a house, it doesn't matter. I use algebraic symbols because I like algebra, that's all. So I is the rule you have just acquired. I plus one is the next rule that you're ready for, developmentally ready for. When the natural order hypothesis came out, I presented a paper at TESOL in 1975 I know most of you were there. TESOL 1975, remember Los Angeles is raining a little bit, you know? I know you were all there because there was a huge crowd to hear me speak. Standing room only. There were 10 chairs in the room and 15 people came, okay? So I gave a talk and I said, we now have the natural order. Let's teach along the natural order. Just tell us. We'll do the early acquired things first, middle, then late. No, wrong, I was wrong. Not for the first time, I was wrong. We don't teach along any order. The natural order is the result of comprehensible input. We don't need to know each rule, where it comes, etc. Here's the, new, the old hypothesis I want to restate. If you give people enough comprehensible input, I plus one is there automatically you don't have to worry. If you have a good meal, all the vitamins you need are there. This morning's breakfast had the vitamin C you needed, the iron you needed, the complex carbohydrate you needed, the selenium you needed. It has all the vitamins, the ones that are discovered and the ones that haven't been discovered. When mommies and daddies talk to children, they don't try to figure out what does my child need today? Well, I think he needs more past tense. Let's talk in the past tense. No, they simply use lots of language and all the rules are there. The grammatical syllabus is impossible. First of all, it has never worked, ever. Remember your English class in school? You went through the whole grammar the first year, then you repeated it the second year because nobody learned it the first year. Also, there's individual variation. Remember in your English class, some of the kids had American friends. They would play with American children, or they lived in the United States. So they had already acquired the rule. Other kids were not paying attention, so they were nowhere near ready. Maybe the rule of the day works for a small group in the middle. Comprehensible input, don't worry. Everybody is covered. It doesn't matter, even if it's a different rule for everybody in the class. I am using this concept right now. You have very different backgrounds in language acquisition. Some of you have even heard this speech before, okay? Uh, others, this is brand new. I'm trying to give a speech that's comprehensible to everyone, knowing different people are getting different things. It doesn't matter. Finally, the grammatical syllabus is boring. It's very hard to say anything interesting and comprehensible to people when your real agenda is the relative clause. What we now say is all you have to do is say things that are interesting, comprehensible, compelling. Grammar takes care of itself, and this is hard enough. All we need to do as teachers, make sure they're paying attention and they're interested in what you're saying. It's a good story, that's what they need. I want to do one final topic. I want to talk about accent. What about accent? I want to give you a conjecture on accent. A conjecture means a hypothesis with only very weak support. So this is just a conjecture, an idea. My claim is this. For those of you who speak English as a second language who have an 
accent. Perfect American English is inside you. It's there. You don't speak it because you feel silly. That's my hypothesis. We have an output filter that prevents us from speaking our best accents. Let me give you the flimsy evidence and why we shouldn't worry about this so much. Number one, our accents are variable. Isn't that interesting? Your English accent varies, depends on how you feel. It happens to me a lot with French. People who speak French as a second language get very, very self-conscious. I'm told sometimes my French is pretty good. Sometimes I'm told I speak French without a trace of a French accent. I remember when I was in Paris once, my daughter was with me, and her French is pretty good. She went to French school. And I was meeting with a sociolinguist in a cafe, a woman who spoke at least 212 languages, but none of them were English. And we, we were talking about her research in French. We got very involved in the conversation, really interesting stuff, a little outside of my field. And my daughter came over, listened for a while, and later she said, Daddy, you really sounded good. Well, that's because nobody was listening. <laughs> Another time, I was in a situation with my colleagues in Canada. We'd been doing research on a project, and I was leading the discussion in the room. All the people in the room were very close friends of mine that I had good, solid personal relations with. One was my friend Hubert, and when I lived in Canada, he would bring his kids over. We would go over to the French side and go roller skating and all that, and he was a French language fanatic. He would not allow his kids to speak English, and he was one of the, it's like that. So my buddy, and I was leading the discussion at the chalkboard in French, having no problem. The door opened and a stranger came in. You can sympathize. My French collapsed on the spot. Involuntarily. It's how we feel inside. My colleague Earl Stevick was teaching a class in Swahili. The best student in the class, the middle student, the worst student. The best student left the class was transferred, the middle student got better immediately because the pressure from the best student was gone. We all have this ability to imitate accents in our own language. You can imitate Cuban, in Cuban Spanish. You can imitate Spanish from Spain. You don't because it's not you. I can speak British English. When I meet someone from London, I don't immediately start speaking British English. I would feel self-conscious. I can imitate people speaking English with a foreign accent. You can imitate gringo speaking Spanish. You can imitate me speaking Spanish. You don't, but you can. It only happens, Peter Ustinov says, uh, uh, I've seen him in movies where his French sounds absolutely perfect. He says he can do it in movies, but not in real life. There is a block. We have our accents for a reason. Accents are like clothing. They mark you as a member of a group. Consider our clothing. We are all dressed today appropriately. We are dressed as attendees at a conference, and believe it or not, I'm dressed as a speaker. There are rules that we follow. I know what I can get away with. I know what I can't. I have black soft shoes. They're kind of walking shoes, nearly gym shoes. If I had the same shoes with a red stripe on the back, it wouldn't work. We have subtle rules of clothing that mark us of members as a social group. The same thing is true with accent. Our accents tell people who we are. Now, nobody has ever developed an accent improvement class that works. I've looked at the ones. There is no evidence any of them really can give you a better accent. But what if we could do it? What if we could give people great accents? perfect, you know, North American accents. It wouldn't feel right. It's not you. I think if we worry about accent, we're playing with fire. People have accents for a very, very good reason. It's, if you have a perfect, suddenly a perfect British or American accent, it's like wearing clothing that's not right for the situation. It's like being slightly overdressed or slightly underdressed. There is an accent I think we can aspire to <coughs> that I think that nearly all of you have gotten. The people I've spoken to 
speak English as members of a universal middle class who speak English, of professional people who speak English very, very well. That's the group. I want to end this with an exception, where there is a place for teaching accent, just like a place for teaching grammar. In the United States, we have, as you do here, we have immigrants from Asia, and we have immigrants from countries who speak languages like um, Laotian. Now, in Laotian language, you don't pronounce the final consonant. And when people do that in English, they're nearly completely incomprehensible. So what we do with ESL students is we say, don't worry about it, but if you get in trouble, think of the rule, insert the final consonant. Only when you need it, like a bandage, not something you have to think about all the time. So let me summarize today's talk. Writing makes you smarter. How about that? Writing does not cause language acquisition. Writing makes you smarter. And we need to give our students a powerful intellectual tool they can use the rest of their lives to help them solve problems. Because of what I said about writing, it might be a good idea for us to stop testing writing. You should be a little surprised. Stop testing writing. Why? When we test writing, we're testing two things, form and content. Writing form comes from reading. Reading and writing tests always correlate very highly. It's a waste of time to test writing. And how can we grade students on creativity and content? That's not part of language. Testing writing is the most expensive and painful part of our work. If we stopped doing it, we would save immediately, every day, millions of hours of suffering of teachers and students. Teachers doing writing exams, students grading them. Include writing as subject matter as a way of making you smarter and solving problems. I also said that grammar is not bad, it's not evil, it's simply very limited and can be used when strict conditions are met. So I wouldn't throw it out. I would never do it in, for children, ever. I would start when kids are older, high school, older, and then not very much of it. Finally, talking about accent, the perfect accent is inside you. Sometimes you use it, sometimes you don't. And I think the best solution for most of the time is not to even worry about it. Thank you very much. Dr. Krasin, we want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and uh, wisdom with us. I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone in this room. It's been a real honor and a pleasure having you in this Congress. Thank you very much. This is a little present for you from the university. Yes, candies. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doctor. Huge applause.